Welcome everyone. We're so happy to have you with us today for a virtual meeting with one of our scientists. Thank you for joining us. My name is Jessica and I work with the education team at the Natural History Museum. Today we'll be meeting with a special guest from our research and collections department. The Natural History Museum is home to 35 million objects and specimens. Our scientists use these collections to conduct research on people and nature, past and present. Each scientist has a special area of focus for their research, but together they are helping to build the history of life on our planet. In just a moment, we're going to hear from Lisa Gonzalez, the Assistant Collections Manager of Entomology. Entomology is a study of insects. Step into the itty bitty world of bugs with Lisa. Since 2012, Lisa has helped oversee the museum's collection of more than 6 million insects, spiders, and other terrestrial arthropod specimens from around the world while exploring LA's own rich biodiversity through NHM's Bioscan project. Join her for some big facts about these tiny inhabitants, like their many surprising uses for slime. I'm, gonna, I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can meet our presenter today, and you'll see me again in a little bit. Hi, Lisa. Hi, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much for joining today. I'm really excited to talk about my favorite group of animals on the planet. We have just a short period of time, so I'm going to go ahead and just launch into the presentation to make sure we have some time at the end for questions. So let's go ahead and do the share screen. There we go. All right, everybody. So as it was already mentioned, I work in the entomology department at the Natural History Museum. And entomology department mostly consists of insects, but we also study some other organisms that are very similar to insects, things that have an outside exoskeleton and have lots of legs. So if I'm gonna start my story, my path as an entomologist, as somebody who studies insects, I have to start with the humble roly-poly. I have to give credit where credit is due. So this animal is actually not an insect. <laughs> Even though I became an entomologist, somebody who studies insects, I first really, really became passionate about small little creatures that I thought were just really mysterious and I just really was very, very curious about them at a very young age. I mean, I think most of us know that kid or multiple kids that are always out looking for bugs and picking up bugs. I was that kid from a very young age. So the roly-polies are actually a type of crustacean that are terrestrial that live on land. Um, they are distant relatives of animals like insects. But roly-polies, you know, they're very benign. They're, they're, they're not dangerous in any way, which is actually true of, of most insects and relatives of insects. And so I would pick them up. I would observe them. This was, you know, by, by the time I was about four years old, I was really fascinated by them. And I really, I give them credit for being the bug that really got me interested in animals that are related to insects. I have to, oh, so yes, so as I was saying, I'm the kind of person that just picks up bugs all the time. I wish I had some photos of me when I was really young, but you know, at that time, this was, I was born in the 70s, so my mom wasn't taking pictures of me all the time, but I just, my entire life, have always loved picking up and handling insects and just being really fascinated by them. And one of my goals with showing people images of me actually handling insects and relatives like spiders is to help people to overcome their fears and to teach people that a lot of them are really, they're more scared of us than, you know, than we should be of them. They're, they're very small animals and they have ways of communicating. And even though they do have ways of defending themselves, most of them are essentially harmless. So, I have some pictures here. The picture in the upper right was actually when I first started volunteering at the Natural History Museum when I was 20 years old. So that picture is 24 years old. And that's me with a stag beetle. I'm gonna look really excited to be working with this stag beetle. That was my first time ever seeing one. I'd only seen pictures of them before. Um, so I started off as a volunteer in the insect zoo helping to take care of some of the insects. And then later on, I also worked in our spider pavilion, which is actually up right now. So that lower picture there, that's me with a giant Nephila orb weaving spider as I was getting ready to help feed them. I also definitely need to mention some members of my family that were really supportive of me when I showed an interest in insects and spiders at a very young age. 
I think that there are a lot of kids that show an interest and maybe it's not taken seriously or it's seen as something that's just kind of a funny habit or maybe other people might say, oh, that's kind of weird, they're icky and, and they dismiss it. They don't take it seriously. But the study of insects is a serious science. It's a very important science. And I'm very lucky that I had my grandmother and my mother and my sister who all encouraged me they never you know, stood up on a chair and screamed when they saw me handling insects. Of course, they would make sure that I looked things up and we knew that I was being safe, um, but they just were very encouraging. My grandma had a garden, we would look for bugs. Um, the reason I included the picture on the right is because that little stroller that I have a, a doll in, I actually used to put bugs in it and tell people they were my babies. So just you know, ever since I was really little, this is something I really liked. I was very passionate about. And then I was also very lucky to be introduced to women who were biologists and who were doing this for a living. So it helped me to understand that this was something I could grow up and study. Uh, maybe some of you have heard of this woman. Her name is Jane Goodall, and she's a very important primatologist. She studies chimpanzees. She still studies now. She's 85, I would believe. She's in her, her mid to late 80s, and she's still doing this. She's still studying chimpanzees. You know, when I was a kid, we didn't have YouTube, we didn't have Cody Peterson, I didn't even have the Discovery Channel. That's how long ago I was born. But we did have National Geographic and I did have Jane Goodall. So I read books. That's actually my first copy of her book on the right there that I read backwards and forwards. And I was so inspired and I just thought, you know, I, I want to grow up and I want to go to the jungle and I want to study animals. You know, it wasn't into chimpanzees, but I knew I just really I wanted to go to a faraway place and I wanted to find new species and I wanted to learn new behaviors. And that was just, I, I was gonna do whatever it took to do that. So fast forward from my childhood to my early twenties again, and this was actually my first trip to the jungle. And you could see in the picture on the left, I'm holding like a, uh, looks like a rubber tube. And that's actually a tool that we use called an aspirator. This is a common tool that entomologists use to collect really tiny insects. Because most of the insects that I study are very small, they're microscopic, and we're gonna look at a few of those in a bit. Uh, and so while I was on this trip, this was right before I started college when I was still, you know, am I gonna be an entomologist or am I gonna do something else? And this trip that I was very fortunate to go on where I learned a lot of skills and I learned a lot about how to actually work in the field, sealed the deal, this was it. I for sure, you know, sign me up. I wanna go to school to study insects and, and that was it. That's what sealed the deal. So this was my first trip to the jungle. There's a picture of me on the right holding a millipede, by the way. So that's another type of arthropod. That's a relative of an insect that has an outside skeleton, has lots of segmented legs. And here's another very, very important tool that I was using and that I still use today. So on the left, that's me in the jungle using a trap that's called a malaise trap, which is a, a tent that's light on top darker on the bottom, and then it comes to a point. So it's taller on one side. And you can see it a little bit in the photo on the right. Um, there's a plastic bottle up there that collects the insects into a sample. So the insects fly in and then they, they wanna go away from gravity. This is something that is an instinct for insects that fly. And it enables, enables us to collect samples. So the picture on the left showing me in the jungle and I'm finding lots of new species. And I, at the time, assumed that that's the only way you can make discoveries, but I was actually wrong. You can make discoveries in big cities like Los Angeles. So nowadays, my main field site is actually working in yards and community gardens and community green spaces. And I set up these malaise traps just like I did in the jungle 20 years ago. And we find new species living in Los Angeles. There are new species to be found in backyards, in cities, and across the U.S. You don't have to go far away to make discoveries of new species, which I think is amazing. So here's a picture of me doing one of the things I love the most. I love field work very much, but then the other half of that is bringing the sample back to the lab and using my beloved microscope. If it looks like I'm hugging the microscope in that picture, that's because I probably am. <laughs> uh, just This is a tool that's absolutely necessary for people who study very small organisms. And you take a sample and you pour it out and then you can see what some of these insects look like on the left-hand side. Those are all macro photographs. Some of them I've taken, some of them another woman took. Um, so most of the images you're gonna see today are, are macro photographs that I've taken. And these, again, these are all insects that were found in yards 
in Los Angeles. Some of them look like, you know, you would have to go to a jungle to find. They're so shiny, they're so gorgeous, but we have lots of incredible insect diversity right here. And here's a picture of the space that I work in, the Entomology Research Department. You can think of it like a library. We do have books, of course, we use books. We use different research materials. And of course, scientific journals are really important as well. But the room is a library that's mostly full of drawers that are full of insects and their relatives. So uh, the picture on the right is a, a tour uh, before the you know, pandemic hit, we would let people come in and we would give tours. And now we mostly are doing virtual tours. Um, and you can see that's one aisle and you can see all the drawers just in that one aisle. And each drawer has, you know, could be anywhere from a few hundred to even a thousand insects, depending on how small they are and how, ma how many you can fit in a drawer. And there are 25 aisles in that room. So many, many insects, we say about 6 million, but actually the number is probably even higher than that by now, because every sample that we take has hundreds to thousands of insects in it. And here's a, just an example of one of the drawers, there's so many drawers, um, but this is a drawer that we would take out for, for outreach if we were gonna talk to people um, rather than taking something out where the insects are really tiny and you can barely see them and appreciate them, we often bring out things that are really big and showy. And a drawer like this sometimes, you know, the initial reaction would be people might be a little afraid. They might think uh, these are really gross or, you know, just maybe a little shocked. Uh, people have lots of different emotional reactions to large insects and large spiders. And that's okay. That's valid. It's understandable. But we really, we, we want to take that emotional response and we want to empower people. We want to teach people the importance of these animals that are so helpful in so many different ways that are an absolutely necessary part of different ecological systems. And we also, we tell people this is what this animal can do and this is what it can't do so that people are empowered to know that you really don't have to be really fearful and there's ways to read their body language and you know, there's ways to just know the different defenses that they have. So this is a big goal of mine when I talk with the public is to help people to overcome their fears through education. Knowledge is power, right? Okay, so let's do a quick presentation on some of the insects that are my favorite. And this is just barely scratching the surface because, you know, I could talk about insects for days and we only have a few more minutes. So um, again, these are all insects that were collected in Los Angeles from backyards. And here are some of the shiniest ones that we've collected. When it, anytime you see an insect that's really shiny like this, we call that structural coloration. And the color is actually coming from the cuticle, from the exoskeleton. So when light hits the exoskeleton, it bends the light. The light goes back into your eye and there are only certain colors or certain, certain wavelengths of light that your eye is receiving. And that's how you see the color. So that animal isn't producing the color, it's not a pigment. And that's why these animals will always look super shiny like this, even after they are dead and they're just specimens in a drawer, they will retain that shiny structural coloration. Really, really impressive and really beautiful. We have a beetle, a bee, and on the right, that's a cuckoo wasp. You see how it's kind of curled up? It's sort of curled up like a roly-poly. It does that to protect itself because the cuckoo wasp goes into the nests of other insects, like the cuckoo bird. It takes over the nest. It lays eggs and its, its babies feed on the nest or the, the babies that are in the nest. So it has to really protect itself because sometimes it goes in there and there's an angry mama that it has to fight. So it curls up and it curls up into a little ball like that. Really, really cool insects that we have flying around all over the US. Here's another kind of cool category of insects that we find. We find mimics. So these are insects that really look like other types of insects that have some kind of defense. And you can see that the insects that you're seeing in this picture, they look like, like a bee or like a wasp. But the three that you see, so the one that's labeled soldier fly, the one in the middle and the one on the right, those are three flies. They do not sting. They do not have a painful bite. They really don't have a way to protect themselves other than flying away or hiding or looking like something that could sting. So they benefit by looking like a stinging insect. And there are lots of different insects that have different forms of mimicry like this. And sometimes 
the mimicry is just physical. It's just what they look like, but sometimes they'll even imitate the other insect too. So they'll move in a way or they'll pretend they'll move their back end of their abdomen and pretend like they have the ability to sing. So sometimes they get really sophisticated with their forms of mimicry and this helps them to live another day. It helps them from being eaten, from being swatted, from being, you know, from being chomped on. We also find lots of really tiny stuff and actually most of the insects I work on are only a few millimeters in size. So if you imagine you take like a, a marker and you make a dot on a piece of paper, that's the kind of size range we're talking about. So on the upper right hand corner, there's a fly called the coffin fly. They're flies that actually feed on animals that are no longer alive, which is a very important thing, right? They're decomposers, they help, uh, you know, they're part of the cleanup crew of the planet basically. And that little tiny coffin fly is glued on top of a pin, the head of a pin. So just to give you a sense of how small it is, um, the little beetle to the left, the feather wing beetle is even smaller than that. It's, it's so small that it can't fly through the air because the air is thick, like you're swimming through an ocean. The insect is so small that the air is super thick. And so rather than being able to fly, it has to paddle through the air, which is why its wings have evolved to look like oars instead of what we think of as classic wings. So this is, these are how tiny these insects are. Um, the weird drawing and picture on the bottom, you're probably wondering about that, or Arnold Schwarzenegger picture. So my, my, my boss and mentor, Dr. Brown, discovered the world's smallest fly in the world. He discovered this in Brazil. And this fly is, is 0.3 millimeters in size, incredibly tiny. But when you look at it under a microscope, it looks like it has big beefy muscles. So he thought it would be really funny to name it after Arnold Schwarzenegger. So it's, the name is actually Megapropotifera arnoldi. That's a mouthful, right? <laughs> so that is the smallest fly in the world. Our entomology lab has the uh, great fame of being, I don't know how famous we are, but we, we get to boast that we found the smallest fly in the world. All right, so what about slimy insects? We were gonna talk about slime today, of course. And this is kind of a, a little bit of a tricky question to answer because usually when you think of slimy animals, you think of things like this banana slug that I came across when I was, I was doing a hike in Big Sur earlier this year, came across a banana slug that happened to match my nails. It was just, uh, <laughs> what a lucky day for me. Really incredible animals, super, super slimy on the outside. But if you notice the difference between something like a slug and an animal like an insect is that they don't have a hard exoskeleton. So insects, you know, they don't really have their slime on the outside of their body, but they do have mucus on the inside, like almost all animals, if not all animals in the world do. And they also have other types of secretions that they can use for a variety of purposes. So this is how we're gonna be able to talk about some slimy insects today. So think, think more about things that are going on on the inside of their body that they can release on the outside in some really crazy ways. So our first couple examples are um, things that can just kind of spit up the slime. Like on the left, we have a katydid, which is a relative of a grasshopper. Both katydids and grasshoppers do this. They basically will regurgitate or, you know, bark basically some toxins that they keep inside of their body. And when they do that, when they, when they get disturbed, like maybe, you know, a lizard is taking a nibble on them or a person picks them up, when they barf that up, that is actually really, really distasteful and it can get coated on their body. So it essentially makes them mildly toxic um, depending on the species, some of them are pretty toxic and others, it's just going to make them taste really bad. So the hope is that the frog or the bird or whatever potential predator is disturbing it is going to say, uh, never mind, you taste awful. You have toxins inside of your body. If I eat you, I might get sick or worse, I might die. So this is one really kind of simple way that insects use slimy, ooey, gooey ooze to protect themselves. On the right, hand corner at the bottom picture there, you've got a ladybug that's actually bleeding ooze out of pores in its exoskeleton. And then it gets like a little bit more sophisticated, right? So rather than spitting it up, it's actually oozing it out of the pores in its body. Here we have a spittle bug, which is actually peeing out, believe it or not, it's excreting this bubbly ooze. And this, this they can use to hide inside of so that other predators or potential parasites can't even see it. And spittle bugs are everywhere. So if you're ever walking around and you see bushes and it looks like someone hocked a loogie up on the bush, that is probably a little tiny spittle bug that's 
hiding out in there and just kind of peeing out this frothy, slimy mess all day. Really cool. This one's one of my favorites. But my absolute favorite example of slime that any insect uses is the Malaysian exploding ant. The first time I read about these, I was so excited. I would love to see one in the wild at some point. Life goal there. So this ant, when it gets upset, it actually has two glands inside of its head. It squeezes its muscles really, really hard in its body. And the glands in its head push the fluid out to the back, to the abdomen, the back end of the body. And it actually causes the ant to rupture. And the goo that comes out is actually really, uh, it stings and it burns the animal that it's fighting with. So you can see these two ants are having a battle here. The exploding ant explodes. The ant dies in the process, but it's saving the queen and the colony. So it's all, you know, this good cause that the ant is giving its life for. So exploding ants from Malaysia, that's my favorite example of an insect using slime to protect itself. So if you'd like to learn anything, if you'd like to learn more about the insects that I work on and our entomology team works on, we have an online exhibit that's called Spiky Haired and Shiny. So you can go to the NHM website and you can see more macro photography and you can also learn about the Bioscan project where we study insects living in Los Angeles. And with that, uh, we can answer some questions. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Yeah. Um, love hearing your story and seeing those really cool tiny pictures. Thank so you. we have a couple of questions from students. I'm gonna start with Henry. Henry is wondering, what is the most unique insect you've caught and what makes it so unique? Okay, great question. So I can't pick just one, so I'm gonna talk about a category if that's okay. Uh, so I work mainly on a group of flies called forward flies that are little tiny flies that some of them are parasites on other insects. And it's not quite a parasite, it's like a parasite and a predator because they actually wind up consuming their host rather than keeping their host alive like a true parasite would. And in some cases, the flies lay eggs inside of ants. The little maggot, the little baby fly hatches, starts to eat some of the muscle and things that are not essential because it wants to keep its host alive for a little bit. And then the mag maggot migrates to the head capsule of the ant and releases an enzyme that causes the head capsule to pop off. So we call them ant decapitating flies. And then from there, it can go through metamorphosis and it's inside of, it's like a little like space shuttle, it's inside the head capsule of the ant. And the body of the ant will still run around for a little bit. It'll, it'll remain alive for like a day or so. So I've actually seen some of these in action. I've seen ants running around without a head and we knew that ant decapitating flies were nearby. I mean, it really doesn't get more exciting than that for someone who studies weird bugs. <laughs> Thank you. That's so crazy, bugs. Um, okay, we have one student who is wondering, what is the newest bug that you have found? Mm, okay, so just recently, oh, this is actually perfect because we talked about spittle bugs. Um, just about a month ago in our samples, we found uh, an adult spittle bug, which is called a frog hopper. We give it a different name. And I saw this frog hopper and I'd never seen it in our samples before. So we believe it's a new species. We're still, we're talking to other specialists to try to figure that out. It takes a lot of, you know, talking to other entomologists and, and doing a, a literature search, reading scientific journals. But uh, this frog hopper is really beautiful. We, we know for sure it's not originally from here. It probably came here from the tropics, but we don't know how, um, you know, probably in a shipment on a plant, something like that. So that's the, the newest species that we found, which was just about a month ago. Very cool. Thank you. Um, so let's see, Candace is wondering if there are any insects that you're scared of. <laughs> you, no, <laughs> um, I mean, I've, been, I've been startled by insects, but I also get startled by my cat on a daily basis. So, you know, sometimes <laughs> something will jump out at you, uh, and it's just startling. Yeah. Um, I one time had a, a, a very large tarantula hawk wasp, which is one of the largest wasp that we have here in the in Southern California. They have a very, very painful sting. And uh, one time I was chasing after it and I thought it flew off, but it was actually still up against a wall and I pressed up against it and almost got stung. And, and yeah, I screamed. <laughs> I might've even said some things that I can't remember right now. <laughs> but yeah, she scared me, but it's, it's, it was more that I was startled by it. But I, I, you know, we, you study something your whole life and you know about them, that really takes a lot of the fear, if not all the fear out of it for you. Yeah. Um, that actually leads me to another question a student had. Um, what would you say to people who are scared of insects? Well, um, so usually I ask them if they're willing to share with me 
uh, anything that's happened to them in the past. And so then that way we can, we can kind of work through it. And I always let the other person guide me because uh, everybody's um, level of fear for insects is different. Some people, it's just kind of a mild fear and other people, it's something that really, you know, really gets their heart racing. And so you have to kind of take it slow. Um, and I just kind of let that person guide me, like, can I show you this bug? Do you want to see me hold a bug? Um, and then eventually you might even work our way up to, you know, do you want to touch this bug? And, and I just try to, um, you know, equip people, empower people with knowledge about that group of insects. Like this is what they can do. These are the, the handful of ones in this area that you really can't touch. And then, you know, let them know all the other ones are okay. Um, you know, basically just talk people through it, but it's a process. Yeah, definitely. Your presentations in the museum have certainly helped me. <laughs> oh, that's so good to hear. Thank you. <laughs> um, let's see. Aiden is wondering, what is your all-time favorite insect? Uh, yeah, that's it's so hard for me to answer because there are over a million insects, at least, <laughs> at least in the world. Um, and, you know, I, they're all interesting to me. I mean, maybe there are a few that are quite as exciting, like aphids aren't quite as exciting as, you know, a big stag beetle. Um, but I'm really interested in insects that have really weird life cycles, um, really complex life cycles that are still sort of like a mystery of evolution. Like how did that come about? Um, so just to name one quick one, um, the bot fly that attaches its egg to a mosquito and then the mosquito feeds on something and the egg hatches, you know, things like that where it's just this complicated life cycle. Those are the ones that get me the most excited because it, it seems like something out of science fiction, but it's not, it's not fiction. It's, it's science. It's real. <laughs> so complicated. <laughs> um, okay. Thank you. Um, William has a question about, I believe it's about the malaise traps. So mm -hmm. he's asking, they're asking, why do their insects tell them, or their instincts, sorry, tell them to go inside the cup on top of the tent shaped structure? That's a great question. Okay. So there are lots of different kinds of insects that have different instincts that have helped them survive over time. And so for some insects, when they reach a, a boundary, an impasse, they'll go down and they'll burrow. And that's how they escape. But others, maybe they've been flying around for forests for a really long time. They reach a barrier and they can go up and over and escape. Maybe they're escaping predators that are lower on the ground, right? And they can fly higher. So that's why this instinct has evolved for them to go up and towards the light. They're actually going towards the light that's guiding them up. So putting the cup there where the light is hitting, it, that's human beings being super tricky and tricking them into going into that cup. So it's not the cup that's attracting them, it's just them going up to the top towards the light and then eventually falling in. Sounds maybe a little cruel, but we only do it so that we can study the insects. We don't, we take it very seriously. We're not killing insects just for the heck of it. We're, we're, we're collecting them so that we can study them. Cool, thank you. Um, okay, we've got time for one more question. Um, where was it? What species, Caitlin is wondering, what species of insects can live the longest? Oh, okay. Um, so there's a queen ant that, is kept in captivity that was on record for being one of the longest insects. And I believe she lived for 20, I wanna say 24, 25 years. I might be off by a year. Um, so that is the last time I checked anyway, the longest living insect. Um, the other really famous one would be the 17 year cicadas. So the cicadas wow. are insects that are uh, somewhat related to the spittle bugs. They have a little you know, piercing mouth part. They spend most of their life underground. So for 17 years, they're underground, and then they all emerge. They mate, they, they emerge, they, they molt into adulthood, they mate, and then that's it. You know? So that's a really, really long lifespan for an insect, because most insects, it's only going to be a year. And for some insects, it's even much shorter than that. It's just a few weeks from egg to adult. So wow, really 17, good. that's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Lisa. We're about out of time. We really appreciate you taking the time and answering all these questions. Um, thank you again for your time. My pleasure. <laughs> so I'm gonna go ahead and close this out for our program this afternoon. Thank you to all of our students and teachers for joining us today. We had so much fun learning about entomology, the study of insects, and all of the different insects Lisa studies at the museum.
We also got to learn about some of the ways insects use slime as a defense mechanism. We'll have all these videos from the presentation on our YouTube channel for you to watch later. You can catch this recording and others at our youtube.com slash NHMLA channel. Uh, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon.